Well, I'm passionate about technology, innovation technology in healthcare. I also love gadgets, of course. After all, I'm a Google Glass Explorer. And my slides are not on, but that's good, because I love gadgets, and we can think about it <laughs> and uh, do it otherwise. But uh, most of all, I am passionate. I love being a doctor, being a surgeon, taking care of patients, and finding, especially finding and thinking, better ways to improve the way we care for patients. I'm going to tell you a story. It's uh, late at night in a health clinic in the Amazon jungle. It's really in the middle of nowhere. They have brought to the clinic a young patient, almost a girl, who's in labor. She's actually not in labor. She has been in labor for two or three days. They have brought her there for you to help her. When you get to where she is, she's laying in there, trembling, shaking. She's very, very sick. She lays there almost like dead. And uh, when you go to examine her, you find that the baby's head is already out. And it has been out for a few hours. The child is alive no more. The small town doesn't have a doctor. There are no doctors. There are no radios. There are no telephones. It's not even electricity most of the time. This actually happened to me. And uh, I remember thinking, what do I do now? What do I do now? We decided to find a boat, put her in the boat, and bring her by river through the Amazon jungle to the nearest hospital, several hours away, many miles away, actually in a different country, in Colombia. So it's pitch black. Someone in front of the boat with a flashlight lighting the way, hoping that we wouldn't crash, but also hoping that we wouldn't be shot by the Colombian army or the guerrilla fighters in the area. We finally got there, and as fast as we could, literally, we dropped the patient in the hospital, hoping that at least they could save the mother. Imagine the impotence, the desperation of having someone come to you for help and there's nothing you can do. And you can't because you don't know how. Imagine the darkness. I actually wasn't an OB doctor. I wasn't a surgeon. I wasn't even a doctor. I was a, a medical student in the last year of my medical school. You see, I'm from Venezuela. And in the last year of medical school in Venezuela, we go for a rural internship for three months, and I chose to do it in the Amazon. And uh, maybe fortunately, I happened to end up alone without a doctor, being myself the doctor, not having graduated there yet, taking care of patients. I really believe that that experience, or at least experiences like that one, really shaped me as a physician, as a doctor. And I have to think that my passion for telemedicine has to come from there. It must come from there. For those of you who don't know what telemedicine is, it is remote presence, teleconferencing, video chatting, real time, just like Skype, between medical providers. In the current climate of healthcare, we all know that healthcare is in trouble. I think that healthcare is in trouble, and I know that technology can help. Technologies like telemedicine can help ameliorate the problem. It's not just the technology. We all know that technology 
develops exponentially. But it's not the technology. It's the idea behind the use of the technology that makes the difference. We all know that the cost of healthcare is unsustainable. $2.7 trillion is the annual cost. Just one year of healthcare costs in the US, that's about 18% of the gross domestic product. That is unsustainable. Another problem is the deficit of providers, of doctors. The World Health Organization has given us a number, 4.3 million doctors. That's a global deficit, the world deficit of doctors nowadays. In the US, the projection is for 124,000 do doctors short in 2025. This map illustrates the current deficit in the US for primary care providers in red. And just like in surgery, when you see a lot of red, that's not good, that's, that's bad. <laughs> So I'm from Venezuela, but I work in Maine. And uh, we have been doing telemedicine for many years. Telemedicine that has grown and evolved with us and helped us take care of patients. We developed a system of multiple hospitals connected to us in the lower third of Maine, in Bangor, Maine. And uh, we cover a huge area, an area that is well, the size of Massachusetts, Vermont, and New Hampshire together is about 26,000 square miles. So about 1,000 times the area of Bermuda. At any particular time at night, one surgeon in my group covers that whole area for surgical emergencies and for trauma. So telemedicine allows us it's like, almost like being a ninja. You can be in two places at the same time. <laughs> so a few years ago, we started doing telemedicine from our smartphone devices. Actually, I did a TED talk, TEDx talk on this in 2011. And by using our smartphones, we can connect to any of the 18 hospitals, uh, hospitals in our telehealth network and uh, not just talk to the provider or even to the patient in the hospital or to the patient's relative in the hospital and look face to face to the, to the kid's mother or dad telling them what's going on, but we can also drive the remote cameras from our smartphone tapping in there. So that is evolution of technology. This short video illustrates the point a little bit. Dr. Dr. Hen. Hi there. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, I heard that you have a patient with a head trauma. How can I help you? Yes, sir. So, it's pretty simple. Device that was devised for, for play almost, we can use now to potentially save lives. It's been an evolution, but we're not there yet. We continue to evolve. And that's where wearable devices, consumer electronics come up. This is Google Glass, one of the newer devices representing that consumer electronics sort of trend. And uh, Google Glass is like having a smartphone in front of your eye. You can search the internet, you can take pictures, you can take video, record video, you can text someone, you can call someone, you can Twitter someone, you can read the New York Times. So it allows you to be hands-free, wearing the device, doing what you need to do with the patient. Improves communication between providers. And one of the problems in healthcare is the lack of communication, the, 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 the nightmare, the, the randomness of healthcare records, for example. It also improves connectivity, connectivity of providers to those health records, for example or connectivity of the providers to the digital information out there that we need to sometimes make use to, to treat the patients. So I came here to share a little bit of my, my vision in regards to this technology, and now I'm also gonna share a little bit more than that. So this is actual view of what I am seeing, okay? 
And okay, glass, take a picture. <laughs> so this is one of the features, but you can really do several things. And uh, again, it's a device that maybe was designed for, for play, but it allows you to do many other things that potentially can help in healthcare. So wearable technology is really here to help us in healthcare. I want you to visualize a device like Google Glass in healthcare. How can that... Okay, Glass, give me patient information. Patient, John D. Smith, beware. Allergic to latex and blood pressure 140 over 90. Okay, Glass, give me timeout info. Timeout complete. Okay, Glass, record an op note and take an order. Recording. So that's uh, an illustration of what potentially could happen. Healthcare providers using glass within the, the, the hospital to access information in the medical records, to do reminders and checklists. So that's what we're thinking of. That's where we are now. Imagine being able to access the medical record in the clinic. When you have a patient visiting you in the clinic, and some of you have not been in the hospital visiting a doctor, and uh, the doctor or the provider, the nurse, is actually not even facing you, but they're getting data from the computer or inputting data in the computer, not having a face-to-face -face interaction with you. That's where a device like glass, a wearable device, can really help. Imagine during rounds, when you go visit patients, rather than sitting in the computer for an hour, getting all the data from the patient before you go see them, or rather than pushing a card with a portable computer or having an iPad or a tablet in your hands and accessing the medical records so that you can make a right decision, imagine if you could have everything in here, if you could access the medical record in a device like this. That you can have that connection with the patient's eyes, face to face, telling them what you think, ordering tests or getting images or lab values. People talk about depersonalizing medicine with devices like glass but it's actually, I think, the opposite. You get to be face-to-face -face with the patient and interact with them as well as with the digital information almost simultaneously. Imagine EMS providers, emergency medical personnel, having glass on and uh, virtually bringing the ER provider there with them, showing them what they've seen, what they're finding on a crash site, for example. It's almost like virtually teleporting them to where they are so that they can see exactly what the EMS provider is seeing. For teleconsultations, for telemedicine, providers having glass to glass communication or wearable device to wearable device communication, where you don't even have to, to, to a, a, a explain to the other provider what you are seeing, but you can show exactly the view that you're having. Okay, yeah, I see him. Um, so what's the story with the patient? Dr. Assad, thank you. This is a 35-year-old male involved in a motor vehicle accident. He was a restrained passenger. There was some blunt trauma to the chest. We've already decompressed the left side. We were about to go to CT when his vitals suddenly changed. He's tachycardic now, 172. His blood pressure has dropped, even though it was better. And his, he's satting well, but we're worried about that hypotension and the tachycardia. What do you think? The monitor, yeah, it seems like uh, the patient is in uh, SVT. It seems pretty regular, so I wouldn't be concerned too much about Wolf Parkinson White. So, another example is telementoring. Having a physician assistant or a family nurse practitioner or a less experienced provider needing help during a procedure or someone performing an emergency procedure that they're not very familiar with because they don't do it too often, and you can be there with them remotely interacting and showing them what to do. You want to make an incision, okay, and after you make an incision, you want to dissect, okay. Obviously, you already have your uh, uh, space uh, already uh, 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 
softly. You're more than welcome to hear me. Uh, to uh, put your finger in the incision and uh, go in the plural so space to feel along. I recorded this with glass on a high-tech mannequin to show a group of paramedics and family nurse practitioners, as well as some students, how to do a chest tube. And they were having exactly the vision that I was having. So that's got to improve their understanding on how to do a procedure. Be able to advance it too easily where you want it. In medical education, it's a fabulous tool. We're actually doing a project right now comparing the traditional recording of how to do a procedure with a glass view of a procedure, how to, how to do it with surgeons, with the, with, the, with, the, with the performer's view. And it has been really, really, uh, so far, uh, uh, have had great feedback on that. Thanks. This is just to illustrate the, 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 the point, but th that iPad could have been in an auditorium back uh, somewhere else in campus or in a different place, uh, in any hospital, anywhere in the world, basically, and you're having the exact view. So again, a story that I told you at the beginning, that happened to me 25 years ago. I needed a surgeon. I needed a specialist, and I couldn't get it. There was no way to access help at that time. 25 years later, now I'm the surgeon. I'm the specialist, and by preaching about this, I'm hoping to bring my expertise, our expertise, to anyone who might need it, in an emergency or not, anytime, anywhere, even to that lonely medical student in the middle of the night, learning how to be a doctor in the depth of the Amazon jungle. Thank you very much.